Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning to some of you. And thank you for joining us for today's special lecture with Jacob Shoshan on the destruction of the Lithuanian Jews and the Ponari massacre organized by the International March of the Living. My name is Liz Panich, and I'm the Director of Programming for the International March of the Living. Since its inception in 1988, the March of the Living has brought over 275,000 students and adults from over 40 countries around the globe to Poland on Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Remembrance Day, and Israel on Yom HaTzmaut, Israel Independence Day. The March of the Living serves as a call to action for our thousands of alumni to do their part to fight for a future free of anti-Semitism, intolerance, racism, and bigotry in all its forms. While we continue to navigate this world that we find ourselves in, the March of the Living is determined to continue educating about the past in order to ensure a better future. For those who know Jacob and for those who don't yet know him, you are in for a real treat. Jacob was born in Jerusalem and is a licensed tour guide, teacher and lecturer for Tour Guide College, Hebrew University, Tel Aviv University and Everyman's University, Tel Aviv. Jacob is also a senior tour director and lecturer for the Geographical Society of Israel. He has visited 107 countries and has led tours in 66 countries on all six continents. He is fluent in many languages and presents in-depth discussions on Jewish history, philosophy, and culture. His background covers Holocaust studies, Sephardi Jewish heritage, and Jewish musicology. Personally, I have known Jacob for over a decade as we have worked together to bring adults on the International Adult Delegation of the March of a Living, as well as other projects, including a trip to the Baltic States. I can tell you with absolute certainty that having Jacob as an educator is a true highlight for all of our participants. And we are really honored to have him here tonight and be able to learn from him in this virtual format. And we are so appreciative that Jacob agreed to do this when it is 3 a.m. in Tel Aviv, and that is true dedication to education. Just a few housekeeping items. We'll give Jacob time to present his lecture and be able to give, him, uh, give us a chance to learn from him and leave the question and answers for the end. You can write your questions at any time throughout the lecture in the Q&A box, and we'll do our best to get to all of them in the time allotted. I trust that you'll find tonight's lecture fascinating and you're in very good hands. Jacob, I turn the virtual floor to you. Thank you, thank you so much. Welcome everybody. I believe I would recognize many of the names and I'd like to welcome also those of you who I didn't know before, just for a few seconds. I believe the song you have just been listening to might be familiar to uh, many of you. If not, you'll make a note and you'll be able to listen to this uh, recording later on and listen to the rest of the song. But this is one of the most famous things that came out of the Ponar story. We'll talk about it later on. In order to talk about the destruction of the Lithuanian Jewry, we have to relate to all three Baltic states being Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, plus destruction, killing, and massacre took place there of Jews who were brought from many other countries in the continent. Actually, we look at a very interesting story of what happened to these regions, this happens to be the pale of settlement. For a long time, Jews were restricted. They couldn't live just anywhere they wanted. You know, they were wandering and being expelled and being persecuted and suffering atrocities for centuries before the Holocaust. But in the late 18th century and through the 19th century, Jews were an early 20th century in many places, they were restricted to live only in a very limited area, which is the Pale of Settlement. This uh, region, which we are going to discover, uh, happens to be part of a very interesting organization that has ruled the high seas and the shores and some routes in the continent of the Hanseatic League. They were tradesmen, they were merchants, mostly they were Germans who set shop in many different ports around and Jews wandered and Jews settled in an area where they can benefit 
from this kind of network, the Hanseatic. They were not admitted as members of the league, of the guilds, of the trade union or whatever, but there was a chance for them to do business, especially the one region we are talking about, which is the Eastern region of the Baltic Sea. Many of us know a lot, of course, about the Holocaust, which one of the first association would be gas chambers, killing six million, all these uh, notions float in our mind. But today I'd like to highlight a story that is, a, or a concept that is a little less known. Two and a half million Jews were not killed in the gas chambers, they were shot. So that is what we call the bullet Holocaust. We don't often think about it. When we think about Western Europe, Eastern Europe, again, we mentioned trains bringing them to death camps, death factories, factories of death literally on the Eastern part uh, of the continent. They were killing them everywhere. Death camps as such uh, were built on Polish soil. Got the Germans who operated them and the Germans killed them. But when we look around carefully, we see there were many, many cases where they didn't take them by train to the, to the guest chambers, to the camps. They sent what they called these mobile killing units, the Einsatzgruppen, who shot them in situ, who shot them in the place. So here we can see a map showing us a few of the many, 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 literally hundreds of locations where Jews were killed by these Einsatzgruppen. From Estonia and from other regions, Jews were taken to the farthest, most northern, most remote death camp. It was a labor camp called Kluga. For a long time was used as a concentration camp. And when they realized they were able to send people there because they could use them for labor, they did not hesitate. Jews were rounded up from many different localities, from many different communities in this region in the Baltic states and sent thousands of them were sent to this location in Kloga. The pictures would be familiar. They were taken in this region, but unfortunately we've seen them in so many places, the humiliation, the insult, the abuse, the degradation, which took place there. And then soon as they realized they were losing it, and when the Russians were approaching, they could hear them, they could see them, they uh, hurried up and killed the remaining thousands of Jews that were still in this very, very far concentration camp, and eventually turned out to be the killing place of Kloga, that's in Estonia. Today, in the site, there is a memorial. Most of the barracks were dismantled. And actually, those of you who have visited Yad Vashem in uh, Jerusalem, the memorial, uh, the Holocaust Memorial in Israel, one of the first pictures, as soon as you enter, text talks about this event. As you see, just a few days before the Russians arrived, they have killed more than 2,000 Jews. We'll take a quiet walk through this uh, forest today, very, very eerie. Only the memorial is there with pictures and facts and figures and dates telling us the story of the site along this memorial. Very interesting to note, I think you all know this document very well from the Vanze conference, totaling and tallying the number of Jews that uh, are still around in this continent. And look at what it says here. Estland is Estonia in the German language. Judenfrei, no more Jews in Estonia. As you see, as early as January 42. Unfortunately for the rest of them, for millions of them, the next few months meant their end. Most of the killing, most of the liquidation, most of the murder took place within the next 16 months. So by the end of 44, there were only the few hundred thousand Jews in Hungary left, other than the ones in hiding, the ones who were rescued by wonderful righteous among the nations, or the ones who were joined, the partisans, the freedom fighters of various nations around the world. 
By the way, I put here a picture of a book which I highly like to recommend. Believe it or not, IBM and the Holocaust. To tally the number of Jews they had to use, maybe the very first version of what ended up being computers, some kind of adding machines and calculating machines. But that, uh, that is a different story. Just I had to mention how was this list created. When we talk about Lithuania, those of you who are familiar with this Yiddish term, Litvaks. Litvaks means the people from Lithuania, but in reality, if you look carefully, it was not only Lithuania that the Jews who settled here uh, were called Litvaks. Actually, it includes big portions of neighboring Latvia, neighboring Belarus, neighboring Poland, and big chunks of what is called Königsberg, today is a Russian territory, uh, separated from mainland Russia by Lithuania. It's called Kaliningrad, but that was a major Jewish settlement. And when you talk about the Litvaks, look at the very large area, it corrects. Some of you might have heard in your house the different uh, discussions between the Litvaks, the Galicianers, the ones who put salt in the filter fish and the ones who put sugar and so on. So this is the land of the Litvaks, as I mentioned, including uh, big areas of the neighboring countries as well. We move to the neighboring country from Estonia. Now we are outside of Riga in Latvia, the capital of Latvia. And it is here that a big ghetto was created, a ghetto that housed not only the local Jews from Riga, but Jews who were brought from many different localities and other countries. Jews were brought here from Germany, from Holland. And then look at the dates on two days, on two days, they were marched to the forest a couple miles outside of Riga, outside of the ghetto. And look, 25,000 Jewish victims were killed. And as we have to mention today, as we always have to say, unfortunately, the Nazis could not have done what they did on their own without very, very generous assistance extended to them by local accomplices. We put on the highest pedestal the rescuers, the saviors. We think the world of these amazing righteous among the nations. We should mention them. We should talk about them, not only to highlight what they did, but to show that a person can make a difference. At the same time, we must address the fact of local accomplices. And that was the case here just as well. In the site of the killing fields, there are a few memorials. And that is another subject that we are very, very active doing. Those of you who know me personally, you know how adamant I'm about it and how what kind of an activist about them. Look at what the signs used to say. They were the victims of fascism written in, in this particular case, written in Latvian, in Russian, and in Yiddish. But if you don't know Yiddish and you don't know what that language is, you might not associate it with the Jews. There were dozens of such memorials erected, finally, with the insistence of Jewish groups and others. But most of them never mentioned the fact that the victims were Jews. And in this particular case, there were only Jews here. It only says the victims of fascism. So now big work is being done to rectify, to change it, to correct it, and to add the information saying, my goodness, this was the killing fields of all these tens of thousands of Jews. On the site of the mass graves, they've erected these memorials, and we move on, and we finally enter Lithuania. Some facts and figures about uh, Lithuania. Vilnius, of course, is the capital a very small population and dwindling. Lots of the young people are leaving the country, moving to other locations in Western Europe now that they are part of the European Union. But look at the number of the Jews. Guys, we're looking at a country with one of the highest percentage of the loss of Jews. Uh, so many of them uh, were killed during uh, the Holocaust. Now, as you see, a very small community still lives here along with many other different ethnic minorities. Lithuania was dotted with dozens and dozens of such small towns as you probably know the word shtetl. These were the small shtetls. 
uh, in which uh, Jews somehow survived. Some of them, some of them did better. Some of them suffered and toiled for a living. In some localities, some of the original houses still survived. Hardly anybody had a brick house. They lived in these wooden huts. And uh, today you can still visit, people still live in them. They fix them up, they added some floor and nobody had real floor at the time. Most of them had like compacted mud with some rags that they put. They didn't have money for carpets or rugs. And uh, it's quite uh, uh, moving to be able to see some of these remaining houses and evidence to the existence of the Jews in this place. Yet, as poor as they were and as tough as things were, they were very, very careful to make sure their children will get Jewish education. Some of them went on to have uh, general studies. They published newspapers. They were uh, literate, at least. They could do the prayer services. And as you travel today through these um, communities, in many, many of these localities, you're going to see some memorials. For example, this is in Shedova. And uh, they are in many other places. Like here, we come to a very interesting town called Shaulai, Shavli, the Jews called it in Yiddish. And a very interesting story of this gentleman. He is so celebrated, he has a his own memorial uh, in this town, right outside his house. He was a owner of a factory, one of the largest shoe factories in the continent. They were producing and exporting both to the east, to Russia, to the Tsar Empire, where 19th century, earlier 20th century, and to Central and Western Europe. His house was turned into a beautiful museum. Now they use it for functions and whatever, but it's interesting to visit and learn the story of this place. He helped build accommodation for thousands of his employees, and that was a synagogue that still survives. That's what it looked like at the time. Uh, and the synagogue still survives. Hopefully it will be fixed. Not far from there, a ghetto was set up, the town of Shauliai, or as I mentioned, the Yiddish version, Shavli. The ghetto occupied the big section of central part of the city. This is an aerial photography of the ghetto. The ghetto itself at the same time was a labor camp in the crowded lanes in between the houses and the barracks where they kept them. They built what they called shops. They built small workshops and small factories and sewing and whatever other kind of work they could do. They did it on the premises of the ghetto. Of course, suffering at the hands of the Germans and at the hand of the local police. Uh, this Country, this countryside we travel through from one small shtetl to the other had some of the greatest yeshivot. One of the big things that denotes Litvaks are the fact that they were the ones who opposed in many locations, they were the ones who opposed the Hasidic movement. And the yeshivot here are the misnagdim, we call them the opponents, the one who rejected Hasidism, which puts on the highest pedestal their rebbe, their spiritual leader, like a guru. But here we have some of the amazing yeshivot that today, these particular cases, an ice cream factory, other locations uh, were used for other purposes. I mentioned the Eisensgruppen and they went into all of these places. Some of them a ghetto was set up, some of them they simply took the Jews outside right away, forced them to dig ditches or just lined them up along some of the beautiful landscape and shot them. In this particular case, I brought you to the town of Malat, Malat. I could have chosen dozens and dozens of such places, but this is an example uh, where we have now a memorial that does justice, that corrects the information. And uh, uh, having here the marches, like in many of the other towns every year, incorporating local communities, which is a recent phenomenon, which is so unreal after these years of denial and hate and rejection. Now, lots of young people who are discovering the history of their towns and communities realize they cannot really relate to their own history if they don't acknowledge and don't take into consideration the story of the Jews. Here we have, in addition to the main killing field, 
we have a few more memorials in the same town where in one location they took out the men to be killed in another location not far from there, women were taken to be killed in addition to the mass murder that took place there. We could have spent a long time going from these many towns from one to the other, but let's come to Vilnius, the capital, and home to one of the most beautiful flourishing Jewish communities. Today, a combination of very traditional, very old and beautiful city with modern, vibrant town, this is the center of town, the big cathedral, and an interesting story here about a, a person who was uh, set on fire. He was put to the stake. He was a Polish nobleman who discovered Judaism, was fascinated by it, converted to Judaism. And when he came back to visit here, he was captured and the clergy people had him executed right here in the cathedral square. We'll be visiting with him later on, Graf Potocki, as the Jews call him, Ger Tzedek, the one who has converted. In along the city, we're gonna discover many different churches, as well as there were many different synagogues, 101 synagogues, shtibels, prayer places, uh, minor prayer places, but now only one exists in this town. Uh, the history of the Jews of Lithuania is, is remarkable because I don't know whether it was genetic or a concentration of very interesting people who made sure to spread knowledge and wisdom, but we had here one of the largest concentration of the greatest intellectuals, the writers, the poets, the painters, the sculptors, the musicians, the singers, such incredible names that you are going to find out yet a very pious, very, very orthodox community. This was the great synagogue, which was located in what we call the Schulhof. It was like a courtyard with 11 synagogues next to each other. People prayed with their peers. Some of them prayed with their social class or with their families or professions. Unfortunately, this synagogue, which held some of the most wonderful services, who invited and summoned here some of the great cantors, the Hazanim who came here from all over. The synagogue survived the war, did not survive the communist regime. When the Soviets took over after the war, the synagogue was devastated and now it's an empty field. Actually, it was dug up recently and they found the mikveh, the ritual bath of the synagogue. So it is uh, quite uh, fascinating to walk around. It was very sad, but quite interesting to learn about what happened here in these narrow lanes of the Jewish quarter of Vilnius, or Vilna, or Vilno in Polish, Vilna in Yiddish, different languages, different pronunciation, the same town, the town of Vilnius. Uh, another interesting story to tell, it was a center of science and of Jewish science, for example. Here is the Yivo Institute, which still exists today, it was moved luckily with lots of the treasures and the artifacts and the books and the manuscripts was moved to New York, but this is West, where it was set up by this amazing person, Max Weinreich, both father and son were busy. And this is what you can see today if you go to Manhattan on 15th, 16th Street, uh, right off Fifth Avenue, there is the Ivo Institute, which also houses the Museum of Yeshiva University, the Sephardi Federation, Quite a lot of Jewish institutions are located in this location. This is a picture of the lady who is the president of Lithuania visiting the Ivo Institute. And they are standing, all these people are standing right in front of the picture showing the ghettos which were set up in Vilnius. Uh, today, more and more signs, more and more memorials are being put up. This one is to commemorate the Yivo Institute. Please look at this little old lady. In this picture, she is uh, 97. Uh, uh, now we has just celebrated a couple months ago her 99th birthday. Fania will talk about her later on. Look please at this map. This map shows us the many, many, many different Jewish communities that existed on the land 
on the territory of Lithuania. We mentioned Shaulai and there was Ponivesh, the yeshiva, Kovna, Vilnius. Look here, Vilnius is in a region which is painted in gray because during the beginning of World War II, there were uh, certain, certain um, uh, regions of uh, Lithuania that were annexed to Poland. So this area, Vilnius was actually under Poland rule and when the Germans occupied Poland, obviously they went into Vilnius and occupied Vilnius as well where for a short while, Lithuania is an independent country and Kaunas, Kovno, was the capital of this country. But if you look at this map, look now at the next map. This map shows the death locations. So you can see almost identical, almost identical, wherever there was a Jewish community, there was a site of mass murder and atrocities. And that's how 92% of the Jewish community of Lithuania perished under a different horrible fate during the Holocaust. I mentioned the ghetto was set up in uh, Vilnius. Actually, there were two ghettos, a big one and a small one. The small one existed in the upper part, existed just for a short while, just for a couple months. That's where they have rounded up the sick, the elderly, and uh, families with children who knew they, who, whom they thought were no good for them. And the rest of them, thousands of them, tens of thousands of them eventually were crowded into an area of just a few streets, as you can see here. And this is the ghetto. Here we have an aerial photography. Again, the small ghetto. The small ghetto did not exist more than, as I mentioned, a few weeks. It was between September and November 41 whereas the big ghetto survived until 43, until they met their uh, horrible death at the forest of Ponar that we'll get to later on and some other locations. It's quite interesting to see that today there are many, many signs in the city. You cannot walk too far without seeing signs. Uh, again, it is written in the uh, Lithuanian language and then in Yiddish, in some locations in English, not a lot, hopefully there will be more, we're working on it, and not in Hebrew, Yiddish, because Hebrew is the language of the state of Israel. The Jews who spoke Yiddish are considered stateless. Big argument. In any case, here we have the gate to the small ghetto where 11,000 Jews were kept and they were all driven to their death by late October, early November 41. Another uh, location here is the sign of the gate leading to the big ghetto. Some memorials here and they had so many Jewish institutions. Imagine before the war, not only these houses, uh, these prayer houses and synagogues, but the Jewish hospital, huge Jewish library, Jewish community offices, schools, high schools, almhouse. And this area used to be the seat of the headquarters of the ghetto. You know the word Judenrat, that word was used in many of the locations in Europe to call the headquarters of the elders of the Jews, the a council of the Jews, the leadership of the Jews. In Lithuania, it was called either Judenrat or Eltestenrat, Eltesten, like the elders of the community. And this place managed to do one of the most impossible jobs to keep life going as normal as possible. The doctors worked hard and they managed for over two years to avoid the spread of pandemics, having no material, hardly any medication and education continued, cultural life continued. Um, unfortunately, this is the place where they would have to distribute the work permit, which meant a lease on life, at least for one more day. And I always think of these people sitting there, the elders, the heads of the communities, and my goodness, they had to play the role of God. Who are we to decide who's gonna survive, who's gonna work? They managed to keep things in order in spite of the tension that used to be there. And sometimes it would create a lowless atmosphere. They had the Jewish ghetto police 
imagine they had, of course, some petty criminals and some more serious crimes, and people were executed right there on the ghetto. The bodies were left around for a while for people to watch and learn. What I find mind-boggling is when I mentioned culture, a theater functioned, orchestras played, music was written, composed, and performed. And this theater today is a puppet theater, used to be the theater of the ghetto, on the premises of the ghetto. And imagine during that time that they would dress up in the evening and go and perform and offer concerts, put on shows, unbelievable. After the war, of course, everything is devastated. It, lots of the cemeteries who did not um, survive, lots of them that survived the bombing and the shooting were taken and were used in secondary use for construction. And now, as I mentioned, correcting. The, in Hebrew, it says the Jewish street, also in Yiddish, the Yiddish Egas. And you see the word Gaonu. Jido is Jewish street in Lithuanian, and Gaonu is named after a very, very important person, the Vilna Gaon. He was an incredible person. You can see the years of his life during the 18th century. And he is concurrent with the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of Hasidism. So here we have two giants concurrently leading the Jewish world in totally different directions. He was a pious Jew, of course, very orthodox, very knowledgeable, at the same time, very, very well versed in general science and Greek philosophy. And he is the one who attempted for the first time, quite successfully, to put the rules and regulations of Judaism into a science you know by the name of exegesis, to try to find a scientific manner in which to put the, uh, the, the, the whole Jewish story into a scientific, mathematical even, system. The Vilna Gaon, his statue, statue stands very prominently right next to the house where his house used to be, his synagogue and prayer house used to be. And unfortunately, this is also the place which invites, wouldn't you know it, repeated graffiti, swastika, anti-Semitic display. What are we going to do with these people? One of the people who was very active in the foundation and existence of the Evo Institute was this Jewish doctor, Dr. Tzemach Shabbat, and he would tell stories to the kids. He was like a doctor do little with the animals and so on, and children used to like to go to see the doctor uh, because of his amazing stories. Another addition uh, to the streets of the former Jewish quarter is the Jewish water carrier. The same artist who did Dr. Tzemach Shabbat has done this statue uh, because uh, it is something to be told. They didn't have running water in the house and some of the poor people who were not educated, that's what they had to resort to make a living, to go to the water, go to the river and fetch water and carry it on their backs in these buckets to be taken into the houses. I happen to personally like very much what he did with the facial expression of the water carrier. This is a very recent statue it was put there just about a year ago. Out of all the synagogues, that's the only synagogue that still exists and that's the only place that still functions as a synagogue. Actually, it was a private synagogue from early 20th century and uh, inside is the only place where we can sit and talk and reminiscence and also attend services if there are enough people who come. The old timers that used to come here and sit around and kibitz and schmooze and talk are no longer, I'm afraid, around. Many of the young people either go to um, about their business or there is a new Chabad Lubavitch Center a little further away which holds services in the place, in the house of the Chabad rabbi. As we walk around in the streets of the former Jewish quarter, we would have uh, seen these names of the Jewish merchants. They had a publishing house, a very, very famous publishing house, Widow and Brothers Rom, 
who published Hebrew, Polish, Russian, Yiddish. They had the most famous version of the Babylonian Talmud, the post-biblical scriptures. They published newsletters and the, st the stores had the signs written both in whether it was Russian or Polish, depending on the period. And in Yiddish, you see the names of the owners. And now as they go and they fix some of the old houses, they remove very carefully layer after layer of plaster to see the Jewish uh, language sign, the Yiddish sign of the stores in this particular place. Uh, they uh, sold in this particular shop, for example, they sold kerosene, gasoline for the house. You see kerosene, nafta in uh, the local language. And here we have quite interesting stories of non-Jewish people. As So those of you who travel with me and heard me talk before, you know how important it is for me to mention the names of these righteous among the nations. And this is a fascinating lady. I will not go into telling her story, but um, you will look her up. And she is unbelievable in the way she helped save Jewish children from the ghetto. Here, this greenhouse, as we call it, was um, used by the local authorities with the Communist Party. The police had their, uh, the Communist Police Museum set up here. But later on, it was converted after the independence 30 years ago by some of the local Jews who survived the ghetto, survived the Holocaust, and it was turned into a small Holocaust museum temporarily now, it's temporarily for over 25 years, but the new one is being erected later on. Look at this statue done by a Japanese artist. Why do we have a Japanese artist? I guess many of you will guess, we'll talk about the amazing Japanese story of this country later on. Inside, we'll walk, it's a very small museum, but it manages to encapsulate lots of the stories of what was here before the war and what happened during the ghetto and what has followed. This lady, may she be healthy, uh, is still around. She, unfortunately, she's not well into her 90s. Not only did she survive the ghetto, she ran away and she was part of the partisans fighting against the Germans. And she was the director of this museum for many years and a docent, of course. Many of us have traveled with her and we were walking around and she was guiding us through the museum for many, many years. This building was the library building. This is where the new Holocaust Museum will be put up as the first thing they put up pictures that have survived from the time. What I find fascinating is the fact that the library was run by this amazing historian, Dr. Crook. And can you imagine during the existence of the ghetto, they were sending late notes. People were keeping the books for longer than they should. Some other people are waiting to read them. And they would have an incredible activity in that, uh, in that uh, library. In another building that used to be a theater building, they have accommodated the new Jewish museum, not the Holocaust Museum. This one talks about the Jewish history, the Jewish culture. When you walk around the streets now, more and more of these stumbling stones, I'm, uh, I, I'm sure you're aware of this amazing project initiated by a non-Jewish artist in Germany. It started in Germany and it moved to many other localities. You find it in Slovakia, in the Czech lands, in Holland, in the many locations. And they put the names of the Jewish people who lived in that house, right outside the house of where Jewish people live, they remove a couple pieces of the street stones or the pavement, and they put these stumbling stones with the name of the person, the year he was, he or she was born. This is a gentleman, Yitzchok. And the fact that he was taken, you see here, into the ghetto in 1941, but in 1943, he was killed in Ponar, the last word, Panerai. That's the name in the Lithuanian language. There were three Jewish cemeteries, a very ancient one from the 15th century. That's as far as Jewish people we know of Jewish people who existed here. And this is the place where the Vilna Gaon, Gaon, by the way, means a genius. That's where he was buried. 
uh, in a small, very, very poor neighborhood of Vilnius, right on the banks of the river, subjected to inundation and floodings, called Schnipishok. Then, when they created the new cemetery, uh, the, this cemetery had to make room for a new sport complex. You must have been following the news. Big, big discussions take place now all over to create a new sport complex on the grounds of whatever is left of the cemetery. So the Vilna Gaon, and with him, it says in the Yiddish language was buried Graf Valentin Pototsky, that Ger Tzedek, that uh, uh, convert into Judaism. A second cemetery from the 19th century also was demolished and the few surviving tombstones were gathered to create a memorial. And finally, the remains of the Vilna Gaon and his family and the Valentin Pototsky, uh, Pototsky and many others were brought into this cemetery, which was set up just before the war. And that's the place where they've allowed the Jews for a while when the ghetto was established to bring the dead and bury them in this cemetery. And that's where the local Jewish community uses the place. This is the Ohel, the marking, the, uh, the mausoleum of the Vilna Gaon and his family. Many, many memorials here to the people who were not brought to be properly buried or buried in mass graves when epidemics start or mass shooting, mass killing, people were not buried in individual graves, they were brought here. We have to mention another amazing person. He was a a uh, German officer who was kind to the Jews. He was captured by the Germans and killed during the time of the Holocaust for being kind to the Jews. Another story is a fascinating project initiated in the late 19th century, early 20th century by one of the greatest philanthropists, Baron Hirsch. He is the one who brought Jews to Argentina. He is the one who did uh, uh, construction, helped construction even on the border between the United States and Canada and the Niagara uh, Falls area and lots of other projects all over. And this is where the Germans uh, put here Herrenskraftpark, a car repair shop. But here too, when it was liquidated, another German officer tipped them off and many of them managed to survive. Unfortunately, hundreds of them still, survive, still uh, stayed here and they were killed, and this is the mass grave of these people. This is the officer, it took us a long time to locate him, Major Flagge, and here is one of the survivors pointing out to his name on the memorial in Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, another amazing righteous person. The ones who remained in the ghetto and from other locations were taken from Vilnius to Ponau. So we leave town, on our way later on to Trakai and to Kaunas, but here you see just a few miles out of Vilnius, here we go to Pona. Uh, there was a big prison right on the edge of the ghetto. Many of the people were kept there before they would be driven out. And you see, they were made to walk south to the Ponar hills, to the Ponar forest. Before the war, this was a very popular place for picnic. People will come for a day out in the forest. Young Jewish people from the Vilnius uh, schools and universities and high schools will go on to have a day out. And this is the jail from where they were marched. There was only one gate leading out of the ghetto, the Rudnitsky Street gate, and they were marched by the Lithuanian police while local Lithuanians would go and raid their homes and look for anything they could use. People were not allowed to take in this case, other, uh, like in other places, uh, any belongings because there was not even an attempt to disguise the purpose of why they are being taken out. Some of them originally were taken by the train. Many of them were made to walk. And here we come to this unbelievable site of Ponar. What happens in Ponar was, during the short stay of the Russians there, an airport was put up nearby and they were preparing a storage place for the uh, fuel 
for the oil that they were going to use for the airplanes. So look what they did. They dug these big, big pits, covered the surroundings of the pits with these stones and bricks and so on to put the tankers. They never put the tankers, but the Germans found, my goodness, what a wonderful solution. Instead of fuel storage, we're going to make it into a killing pit. People were marched, lined up along the edge of these pits, and were shot down into the pits. We have some original pictures, not too many. Jews were made to run through the lines of the Lithuanians. That was the best show in town. Local people came to watch and participate and go for the looting because Jews had to strip. Jews had to take their clothes off in many times so they could go through their belongings. Maybe they'll find some valuables if it was left there or just the clothes. Look, they had to cover their heads. They were forced to take off their shirt or their top or something to cover their heads. And that's where they were shot down into the pits. Uh, 75,000 out of 100,000 people that were brought here. And after the war, some of them were not even uh, taken into the pits they were found right outside this area where the barracks were put up. We have some amazing testimony, very rare one, of a German officer who writes it. The story is, how do we know so much, is because of this gentleman, Kazimierz Sakowicz. He was a Polish journalist and he watched the people walked and he actually was counting the shooting. He could hear the shots. And that's how he could calculate, and that's how we can come up and tally the number. And this is one of the upsetting stories I was telling you about. They put a sign up, written in the Russian language and in the Lithuanian language, but it talks about people. It doesn't mention Jews. And that's why it was so important for us to put, you see, like to move these pieces apart, kind of, and insert in the middle a correction seeing here in the forest of Punar from July 41 to July 44, the Hitlerite occupiers and their local accomplices have annihilated 100,000 people. 70,000 of them are Jews, men, women, and children. Today, actually, the number is closer to 75. So this is something that I mentioned we are very busy walking around, traveling around all over to correct and rectify and put the facts. A march is being held here every year. Uh, there are different uh, Holocaust commemoration dates. In Israel, of course, we follow uh, Holocaust Memorial Yom HaShoah to commemorate the onset of the uprising in the Warsaw Ghetto on April 19. We use the Hebrew date. Uh, uh, January 23rd is mostly held as an international one. Lithuania have their own and every year a big march with the members of the Jewish community, many local authorities, the army participates. It's a very dignified area. And this year, and I hope she'll be with us for many more years, Fania Brantsovsky, this lady, a beautiful lady, a member of the partisan movement. She was in the ghetto, she was fighting uh, in uh, during the war and after the war she was among the avengers and then for many years she has been working can you imagine to date walking with a walking cane she is the librarian of the yiddish department in the vilnius university and here she is laying a wreath during the last ceremony you see everybody's with the mask this is just a couple months ago and here she stands and she sings the a partisan song, along with a very interesting lady, Maria Prukoves, a non-Jewish lady, a Lithuanian of Polish descent, who is fascinated with the Jewish story. She studied Yiddish and she sings. She's a professor of anthropology in the Vilnius University, dedicating her life to Jewish musicology and especially Yiddish songs from before and during the existence of the ghetto. Where the pits used to be now, we have memorials. There are seven of them. You walk from one place to the other, but one of them is very moving. 
when the Germans realized they were going to lose the war in an attempt to hide any evidence of their heinous crimes, they have created a small bunker in one of the pits. Every night, they would bring down what they call the Sonderkommando, a few dozen Jews who were made to do the gruesome job of digging up, exhume the bodies and burn them. So nobody will find out what they have done with these tens of thousands, 100,000 people. The Jews were gang chained. They were lowered by the ladder into the bunker at night. And they took advantage um, during uh, Christmas uh, night, uh, realizing uh, that uh, the Germans might be busy. They tried, they failed, and then they tried again, uh, in, as you see on the dates. And unfortunately, they uh, were mostly captured. Only two people survived from the ones who managed to escape. Uh, we don't really have individual tombs. Mostly is the mass graves, but here one stone was erected uh, to commemorate the workers of these shops, as they called them, the factories, the Hakepe, the Herrenskraftwerk, Kailis, and the others who were shot, all of them on the last day, right before the Russians came on uh, July 5th, 1944. A small museum is also located here where we can see some of the artifacts that were found when the bodies were exhumed later on and when they fixed the mass graves. So we have the list and some of the pictures. And uh, unfortunately, a very small one and not frequented by too many people. This is the place of the nearby village where the Polish artist used to write. And he buried his uh, writings in the courtyard and they were discovered only uh, much uh, later. Unfortunately, he did not survive to tell the story, just uh, his writings uh, were found and that's how we know so much about what happened there. We started with a few sounds of one of the songs written about Ponar, and here is one of the most famous one written by Avraham Sutzkever, one of the greatest Yiddish poets of the 20th century, describing his impressions of Ponar, and this is Maria Krupoves singing uh, the song Stiller Stiller, the song about Ponar. Here I put the lyrics of all of the song and you can uh, look them up. It's a very, very moving, moving song. It was written to a child whose father was killed. The child is in the ghetto. My goodness, what a lullaby song, right? About his father who was killed in the ghetto. The music, the tune was composed by an 11 years old boy, Alex Volkovsky, who survived. This is a poster to a concert that was held in March 6, 1943 in the theater in uh, Vilnius. And can you imagine, they had this cultural activity, plays and music and singing, and he would also play the piano. He, by the way, survived. He ended up moving to Israel and he became one of the most prominent, most celebrated musicians, a performing artist, a pianist in Israel together with the partner. He himself never married, didn't have children, but he was uh, playing along with another lady. They picked up a beautiful place in a suburb of Jerusalem, an artist colony, Ein Karem, a very, very picturesque uh, location and they had their music center and it was like a pilgrimage site to go and visit with them and hear them play. An amazing young man. Here they are. That's him as a child after the war. Here is 13 years of age and this is him, Alexander Tamir, playing with Bracha Eden, his uh, music partner. Another amazing person who is, thank God, very much around, still a young man in his 60s, he came to Vilnius to teach Yiddish. He's one of the greatest Yiddishists alive. Born in Brooklyn, spoke Yiddish as a mother tongue, moved to England, taught in the university there, and then came to Vilnius and he's been there ever since. But in addition to Yiddish, which is his mainstay, he's one of the greatest uh, dictionary makers and unbelievable linguists, but 
he fights bitterly against what happens today in denial of the Holocaust. Look up his amazing website, Defending History. Very easy. David Katz, Professor David Katz. He worked in the Yiddish department with Fania. She was the librarian. She still is. He left and he dedicated his life to fighting any display of anti-Semitism, correcting Holocaust denial, and so on and so on. Look him up. Fascinating person, David Katz. In addition to the uh, Jewish synagogues and prayer houses, we have a few prayer houses of a very interesting Jewish sect called Karaite. They themselves do not call themselves Jews. They say we are Karaite. We are of mosaic origin. This is the religion who does not accept the rest of the post-biblical commentary. No Mishnah, no Talmud. They stick only to the text, Mikra in Hebrew, hence Bnei Mikra or Karaite, Karaim. And here we look at their synagogue or their prayer house in Vilnius so we can move to the Lakeland, where they were brought here already centuries ago by the Grand Duke because they were considered to be very tough fighters. They were brought from the Crimean Peninsula. And this is their synagogue here, Kenesa, they called it. Not Bet Knesset, but Kenesa. They preserve a very interesting language, which is the Karaimu language. It's a Turkic dialect from the uh, um, Crimean Peninsula, and you know where their houses are because everybody would be allowed to have two windows in the facade of their house. They were the only ones who were allowed three windows, so it's quite interesting to walk around this beautiful community right on the lakes. That castle was the first capital of Lithuania dating back to the 14th century. And the whole area is the remnant of the last uh, uh, glacial activity from 9,000 years ago. All these lakes were the former glacier locations. I could talk a lot, but I want to go quickly to Kaunas. And we travel to the city that used to be the capital of independent Lithuania between the two world wars. And here also we see a very lovely typical European town. Only one synagogue survived out of the dozens that used to be here with their markers, the memorials on the walls of the synagogue, a beautiful children memorial in the courtyard. And this is the story that is so important to say, to tell. Even before the Germans started their activities, the local fascists, the local nationalist Lithuanians would round up Jews in the street at random. This is a very famous case. 50 people, more than 50 Jews, were taken into this place called the Lietukes garage. They shoved hoses into their mouth and turned the water on, making them implode. And that is how the local people started the Holocaust. When the Germans set shop, they set up a ghetto here. This is the gate leading into the ghetto. You see the location of the Lietukes garage. And right across the river in an area called Slobodka, that's where the ghetto was set up. Again, the famous pictures from the ghetto. And here in Kovna, in Kovno, Kaunas, we have more pictures than any other ghetto because of this amazing man, George Kaddish. He was a photographer who made a living during that time. He was employed in the Jewish hospital in the x-ray room. So he had access to the materials, to the film and to the way to process and develop and print. And using a camera, which by the way is kept very prominently, his very original camera is in Yad Vashem. And he has taken hundreds of pictures, some of them through the whole the buttonhole of his uh, coat or jacket. And that's how we know so much about what happened there, about daily life and, of course, unfortunately, the atrocities and deportations. As you have seen probably in other places, the one of the streets that was used by the local population went through the ghetto, the main street. So a bridge was put up so people can move from one side of the ghetto to the other side without going through the street of town. 
And these pictures are an amazing source and also a very moving one. One of the most famous pictures. This writing on the wall was written by somebody who was just shot. He is dying. He uses his blood. He tipped his finger into the blood and he wrote on the wall, Yidden, Mekume, Jews, revenge, Nekama. Another very moving document was written by Elhanan Elkes. He was the chairman of the Judenrat or the El Testenrat. In the very beautiful, beautiful Hebrew, he's writing to his children who by then went to study in England and they survived. And the letter did arrive, imagine. He writes uh, uh, the letter in November 43, so shortly before the end. One of the famous buildings that still exists on the territory of the ghetto is the yeshiva, the Slobodka yeshiva building. Nothing is there as a school or Jewish other than this sign uh, that says that until the 22nd of June 41 stood here the famous, world famous uh, Slobodka yeshiva. Uh, another righteous gentleman was this amazing doctor, a Lithuanian doctor who was working in the hospital and he would claim all kind of makeup, all kind of stories. And that's how he was able to smuggle and save the lives of many, many children from the ghetto. Around Kaunas, there were many forts. We are in an area which is a border area with Eastern Prussia. The Germans are just a few miles away centuries ago, not only during the war. So the town was surrounded by this kind of fortresses. It was here in the seventh fortress where in 1941, the Germans have killed 3000 Jews. But it was here in the ninth fort that they have killed tens of thousands of Jews. And here we have the sign again, we had to, uh, to make the changes. The sign here says that this is where the Nazis and their assistants killed more than 30,000 Jews. Today we put the figure at about 37. Many of them were simply taken out against the wall and were shot. We can still see the bullet holes and shooting marks of where they were killed. Others were kept a day or less in jail. Many others were simply marched from the ghetto and other locations and were shot here at this place. I personally find this memorial to be one of the most moving ones I've ever seen. It was done in the communist period by local artists, but it's a most, it's huge. It's remarkable and very, very powerful, very present. Then there was a sign, and now we have more and more signs. Oh, the city of Munich. Oh, the city of Vienna is lamenting and is uh, uh, feel sorry for the loss of their citizens who were taken here. Again, here were the Sonderkommando. They were in, in charge of liquidating and burying and burning and whatever with the bodies of the victims. Here, they took advantage of a night where they thought they could escape and they escaped from this cell where they were uh, kept. Most of them, unfortunately, were captured, but some survived and some survived into until a few years ago. Living in Israel, I was privileged to have met a few of them. Some people were driven here and brought here by train. And that is something that is still a confusion, a very big question mark. We found this writing on the wall. Jules Hershkovitz from Ant Anvers. Anvers is Antwerpen in, uh, in Belgium. He escaped to Monaco. From Monaco, he was captured. Remember, the southern part of France was held by the Vichy regime who cooperated with the Germans. He was sent to Drancy, which is this concentration camp right outside of Paris, a detention camp, and was shipped to Kaunas. The next day, he was shot. Why did they bring the people from so far away from Monaco? They carried them through the whole continent to the far remote northern part of the continent. One night and he was shot the next day. Now starts a very special story where Jews fleeing from uh, uh, Poland uh, that is occupied by the Germans come to Lithuania, which is still independent for a while. 
and they want to escape, but nobody lets them go anywhere. They don't have documents, and who's going to grant them a visa, and where could they go? The world is already at war. We are already into 1940. Here is this fine Dutch gentleman, Jan Zwartendijk. He runs the Philips uh, radio factory. They manufacture these radios in, um, in Kaunas. And he sees the plight of the Jews and he has a brilliant idea. There are Dutch colonies in the Caribbean, in the Southern Caribbean, Curaçao, Aruba. If you wanna go there, you don't need a visa. He goes to the Dutch ambassador in Riga in Latvia and he asks him to make him a consul, which he does. And he cooperates with the Japanese consul who was sent here from Japan telling him that if these people claim they go to Curaçao, they don't need a visa. Why don't you help them? This is the amazing Chiyune Sugihara, born January 1st, 1900, an easy day to remember. Was sent here not really to be any consul. There is no diplomatic job for the Japanese to do in 1940, but this is the time before Operation Barbarossa, before Germany attacks Russia or the Soviet Union. And he sent as a spy and he set shop in this house. Here is with his family, with his wife and children. And that's where the Jews came to him, to his office after Jan Zwartendijk would stamp their paper saying, you don't need a visa to go to Curaçao. Here they line up outside his house and he puts this transit visa. What is your name? So-and-so. And he writes down the name because you see, he, the people want to go to Suriname, Curaçao, and other Netherlands colonies. So he grants them transit visa. Actually, it was not so easy. He contacts his government. He says, I'm going to do that. And they said, no. He says, again, that no. And then he says, if I will obey my country, I will betray my God. And against his government instructions, he issues thousands of visas. This is what they put on the sign on the gate. The original gate still exists. They added the sign, uh, Gates of Hope, Visas to Life, Visas for Life. And that's the title of the book written by his widow, Yokiko. I was fortunate to have met her before she passed away a few years ago. And they escaped from uh, Kaunas. They went to Moscow, where from Moscow they would board the Trans-Siberian train to take them to Vladivostok, from which they would continue into Japan, supposedly to go to Curaçao, which of course nobody did. From Japan, many of them were rounded up by the Japanese who by now occupy Manchuria and big parts of China, and they were incarcerated, many of them in the ghetto in Shanghai. And after the war, they went to Hong Kong, to Indonesia, Australia, United States, Canada, and of course, many of them came to Israel. This is Sugihara visiting Israel, meeting with one of the survivors, Dr. Zerach Varhaptik, who was Minister of Religious Affairs. His house now, or the consulate, is the Center uh, Diplomas for Life Foundation. And he was uh, reprimanded by the government. He ended up being sent to work as a traveling salesman in Siberia and all kinds of remote places in the Soviet um, Union. And we were looking for him for the longest time. And it was only when he came for a vacation to Japan that one of the people who was looking for him, a survivor, who made the point of becoming an employee of the Israeli embassy in Tokyo. He was looking for him for 15 years. And he said, you are Mr. Sugihara. You saved my life. And that's when he was recognized. He was invited to Israel. He planted this tree in the garden of the righteous among the nations. This is his son next to a sign that was put up in the town of Netanya. We named lots of streets and forests and all kinds of uh, places after him. And even as recently as a few, as you can see, less than a year ago, a new memorial was put up next to the hotel where he stayed when he had to vacate the embassy. You see, the Jews were following him. He's in the car. He says, what's your name? Moshe Goldstein, he writes it down. What's your name? Shmuel Ziegelman, what's your name? Then he, he has to leave. He gets on the train. He sits in the train and from the window, what's your name? What's your name? 
and he writes down the names of these people and then he throws the empty visa and the stamps they might be able to forge the documents. What an incredible, incredible person, Cheyune Sugihara. We are still in very good touch with his family. Actually, during one of the last uh, marches of the living, his son, his family, his descendants marched with us in Auschwitz. This gentleman uh, was the director of the Sugihara Museum. He passed away a while ago. And when his son heard about it, he said, please wait with the funeral. And he came, Sugihara son came to participate in the funeral of these uh, young men in the Jewish cemetery in Kaunas. I'm a little behind time. May I take a few more minutes of your time just to point out one of the small shtetls on the way back from Kaunas to go to Vilnius. This was one of the most typical community, but apparently there were people who were a little more affluent to the point that they built a magnificent synagogue, a wooden synagogue. That was very typical of synagogues in Lithuania, the wooden synagogues. After the war, it was neglected. It was used as a warehouse. It piled garbage and you could not access it easily. And we, with the help of some of the descendants of the people from that town, the town is called Zezma, Zezmarie, Zezma, the Jews called it in Yiddish. Now they're cleaning and fixing up the synagogue and it will be absolutely wonderful place to look at. Concurrently, because of this activity, local teachers in the school have uh, re recruited the children and their parents and are walking through this cemetery and many other cemeteries throughout, cleaning them up and fixing them up to somehow commemorate. It might not last long because if you don't take care of it, overgrowth will cover it again, but hopefully there will be something else. I want to conclude back with Ponar, where we bring uh, of course, not only the tourists and visitors, we make sure we have a program called uh, Witness in Uniforms. We bring Israeli soldiers and officers as we bring them to Poland. You have seen them marching with us in the March of the Living and they come year round. And we brought them here. And I put here the words of one of the most powerful songs uh, that were written in Israel by a very famous Israeli poet, uh, Chaim Guri because of the fire that was burning there in the bottom of the pit. And I think you can read it for yourself. Very, very emotional, very, very powerful words that were written by Chaim Guri relating to what has inspired us and what is threatening us, as you can see and as you can read in Israel. And why is it that important that we have Israel and that we have a, a very strong Israel? Thank you for watching and listening. And I believe there will be questions now. Here I am. Please go ahead, Liz. Thank you so much, Jacob, for this sombering but very important lecture. I'm sure I speak for everyone when I say thank you for sharing your knowledge with us and to opening up our eyes to new topics and realize that there's so much more we need to learn in order to commemorate those from the past in order to tell our stories. We do have several questions that came in. I'm not sure if you want to go through the Q&A or if you'd like me just to pick a few. Please, please go ahead. Okay, so we had a bunch of people that mentioned that their family descended from these places and they'd like you to know that and thank you for, for sharing this knowledge. And I do apologize to everybody in the audience that we can't get to all the questions, but I will just go through several. Um, there was one question about who who, enact, who put together these monuments that you kept speaking about that, that are showing up all over. Who's responsible for that? So it's the local Jewish community with different international Jewish organizations and individuals, uh, people who will uh, put up the funds, who will uh, underwrite, who will finance it, and people who will uh, uh, work with the local authorities because you must get permission to do that. So it's the local Jewish community and, uh, and different people from all over the world. Okay. Um, given, someone asked, you know, given everything that's happening right now in Poland and, uh, you know, assuming responsibility, what is the culture like in Lithuania um, in terms of acknowledging what happened? So, unfortunately, it's even worse than it is in uh, Poland. Can you imagine they put a genocide museum without mentioning the Holocaust? 
how can you talk about any kind of genocide that happens to anybody in such a country which loads hundreds of thousands of their citizens without mentioning the Holocaust? Every now and then we will have in the Lithuanian parliament somebody speaking up. We'd like to ignore them. We'd like to shrug them off. We'd like to, you know, concentrate on the wonderful people who do educate, who do make sure to include Holocaust uh, studies in their, in their curriculum at schools, the people who come and attend the many different events set up by the Jewish community. And the, the, the key, as far as we are concerned, those of us who are very busy doing and spreading this kind of information, uh, education. Education is the key to everything. And you know the, the famous phrase, if you think education is expensive, try ignorance. And it is ignorance that leads to whatever it is that we witness in Poland, in many other locations, unfortunately, anti-Semitism and good old Jew hate is raising their ugly head in so many locations around. And maybe I shouldn't talk to you about it because many of you live in a country where you witness and you, you hear about lots of things that are happening now, even in your communities, sorry to say. To um, thank you to to try to lighten the note slightly. What is it like for Jews that live in in Lithuania now? The three thousand that you mentioned. Oh, they are quite comfortable. Many of them are in business. They are in leading positions in culture. There is a member in the parliament. There is a famous writer. There are people in the media, in television, in the theater. Uh, some of them own uh, businesses. They are quite comfortable. There are a few of the elderly uh, Jews, the remaining ones, and. The, ch the choice is theirs because anybody who wants to, in a split second, will become an Israeli citizen. He can contact the Israeli uh, representatives and they can move, immigrate to uh, Israel and become Israeli citizens. And as European citizens, they can move to any uh, country in Western and Central Europe and become uh, members of the local Jewish community there. So whoever is there now is by choice. And as I said, many of them are quite comfortable. I'm gonna just end on one question um, because of the time, but if anybody has a question that was not answered that you would like, I, I would encourage you to send them to MOTL at MOTL.org and we'll do our best to um, perhaps Jacob in his free time can answer them. But we have a lot of people in the audience today that are descendants of these Jews and they're wondering if they wanted to know more about their family, where could they go? Okay. I am gonna uh, send you, Liz, to the March of the Living Office, the address of a very, very good genealogist, a Jewish lady. I will send you her information and you can contact her. She has access to amazing records. She has digitized, she has scanned dozens and dozens of records from various communities, from various towns and villages in Lithuania. And she's very, very good. She speaks English fluently, of course, prominent member of the Jewish community. And you'll be able to contact her and she will uh, provide the information. Thank you for that. And if anybody would like to contact us, I can get you that information. And I thank Jacob again for his time, for his knowledge and his wisdom. It's always an honor to be with you. And I always learn so much from you. And hopefully we can do this again in the future. And to the rest of you, I say thank you for joining us and to join it to learn more about educational webinars being offered by the March of a Living, you can visit our website, motl.org and follow our various social media channels. And we look forward to joining you at our August webinar. And thank you very much again. And shalom to everybody. Stay safe.